Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jason Chavan. Uh, I created Memo. All right, so today I'm going to talk about what is Memo for basically the first half and then go into kind of what else is possible. So what is Memo? Memo is both a protocol and an application. Uh, Memo is like the protocol, and then memo.cache, the website, would be the application. Actually, before I dive into Memo itself, uh, I want to take a step back and talk about like, what do applications look like now, right now. Uh, so, you know, the buzzword for the last five to ten years has been the cloud. Uh, pretty much everything now runs in the cloud. Uh, a good example of that would be like Dropbox, uh, where, you know, you have one computer and you, uh, you know, save a file and then that gets uploaded up to the Dropbox and then you turn that computer off, turn another computer on later, and that computer is able to download that file from the cloud uh, from Dropbox. So these two computers don't need to be on at the same time and the, the cloud is the intermediary. If you actually look at basically every app right now, uh, you know, Facebook, et cetera, that's, that's how they work. Uh, you know, you go on Facebook, you uh, post something, you turn off your phone, you know, somebody else goes later, and they, you know, turn on their phone, and then they, they view your post by downloading it from the f Facebook servers. Um, I'm sure this is, you know, not new to anybody. Uh, but this is basically how everything works. You know, eBay, same way, you know, you post your item on eBay, uh, you know, you don't have to stay, you don't have to keep your computer online. Uh, other people can just access eBay and, and see your item and bid on it and whatever. So that's basically how, how the modern ecosystem works. Uh, so enter blockchain. Uh, a good way to think of a Bitcoin transaction is similar to like a check. Um, and then an address can be sort of thought of as like a, a bank account in the kind of analogy I'm going to use. Uh, so in a check, you, you have a payee, you know, the address that you're paying to, uh, you have an amount, and you have a signature, um, similar to like the digital signature you would have with a, a Bitcoin transaction. Um, and then once it gets mined in a block, uh, you know, the block header can be thought of, or not the block header, the block height can be thought of as, as the date that the, the check was processed. Um, so the one item on the check that uh, isn't included in that is the, the, the memo field, uh, which is where memo gets its name from. Uh, and so similar to like a, a check in a regular Bitcoin transaction, you can include, you know, any other type of data you want to. Uh, similar to uh, the talk yesterday, um, uh, the crypto graffiti. Um, so, uh, you know, we don't just put like, you know, raw text necessarily into this data field. Uh, we created a, a protocol. Uh, so uh, basically, there's like a prefix and then, um, you know, other data fields after that. So the example I have on the screen here is like MO2 and then like hello world. So the prefix MO2 refers to uh, basically posting a message. So this basically gets written to the blockchain and it basically uses the blockchain as a database. Uh, and you can kind of think of it as like a, a column, like uh, like an append only, and like MO2 is like the first column, and then like hello world is the second, and you could, you know, query kind of against that database. Um, so for setting your name, that'd be like uh, uh, M01 would be setting your name. Uh, so like this particular user using their, their bank account uh, or their, their Bitcoin address, you know, they would have previously set their name to, to John Doe and then wrote hello world, and then just by posting these to the blockchain, they show up on the memo.cache website, uh, basically using the blockchain as a database or as like the cloud, you might think. So, you know, I can be on my computer one, you know, I, I issue my Bitcoin transaction that, that uh, uses these prefixes, it gets written to the, the blockchain, somebody else later, they turn on their computer and then they read from the blockchain this, this information. Uh, so this is basically like a decentralized way of doing applications that don't require an intermediary like Dropbox or Facebook or eBay. Um, and since it's a public database, uh, you know, like I said, memo.cache is one implementation of the protocol. Uh, almost immediately after it was released, there's become um, other implementations. So member app is another implementation that exists. It basically uses the same exact data and formats it kind of like Hacker News or, or Reddit. Um, you, can re you can create accounts on here, you can like things, you can reply to things, just like you can do on memo, uh, on memo.cache. 
uh, if someone's on memo.cache and they post something and then someone replies to it on member app, you would have no idea that it came from a different application. Uh, it's basically the same database. Um, so basically you have now these decentralized applications that can interact with each other. Uh, and, they, and then they're not limited to just the, the protocol actions that the memo.cache site uses. Um, this, this map, this is a feature that doesn't exist on memo.cache. Uh, this is something that was added to member app um, on their own. And basically, they can post like, you know, an allocation and, and some information about it, and uh, people can comment on that on that location. So, uh, I like to think of this sort of as like a, a precursor to like the decentralized Yelp. Uh, you could you could post um, locations and, and comments just like like on Yelp. You could uh, I don't know if they have reviews or like you know ratings yet, but uh, it'd be easy easy to, to add that on. Memo.cache doesn't have support for this yet, but we'd love to add support for it at a later time. Or, you know, it doesn't even matter. Any apps can add whatever features they want, and and there's not, you know, there doesn't need necessarily to be consistency between apps. Um, and in fact, even if people use different prefixes, if they meant some sort of similar things, you could kind of combine those two later. Uh, and uh, Memo is open source, so you could go online and, and download it. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it for like a, a normal user. This is basically like the server version, uh, but but the code is all out there, so you can see how it works. So that's kind of an overview of Memo uh, as exists today. So the the second part, uh, which is probably the majority of this, is is like where where we're going next. Um, so as I said, the the open source. Uh, code was for basically the server version to, to download every single memo from the blockchain and store it in a database. But like if you're a normal user, uh, you don't want to connect to the blockchain and download every single memo uh, that ever occurred. Uh, that's not going to be practical like on a phone. Uh, but just like uh, Bitcoin is, is supposed to be usable at, by like a light client, uh, it's called SPV, Simple Payment Verification. The, the same technology can be used uh, to do uh, basically light clients for applications as well. Uh, so something that was added later was something called Bloom Filters, which is like a network protocol uh, action you can do. And you can say, you connect to a Bitcoin node, you say, hey, this is my address, give me all transactions related to this address. And uh, that's how a lot of uh, nodes connect to the network and, and don't have to like download the entire blockchain to, to uh, you know, interact. So you can put more than just an address in a Bloom filter. You can put any data that exists in a Bitcoin transaction. So like I was saying how in the memo field you can put the prefixes and then the, the data point. Uh, you, so you can now add those to, to the Bloom filters as well. Um, and so like another example of, a, of an action on memo is like M, I don't know exactly what it is, but if you reply to something, there's actually multiple data inputs. So it's like the prefix, then the transaction hash of the, the post that you're applying to, and then whatever your reply is, and a, a like works the same way. So now if you post a message, you know the transaction hash of, like, of your post, so you can add that to your Bloom filter, and basically it'll capture all replies or likes that relate to that particular post. Um, you know, Bloom filters aren't the most efficient, uh, so you know, long term I'm, I'm sure that things will be, need to be improved. Uh, but it, it provides a method to do a light client um, and basically interact with the blockchain as like a database. All right, so one of the first issues uh, people started talking about on the site, they're like, all right, so I sign up for memo.cache, it generates a key, like a private key for me, um, and then I start using it, and that becomes like my identity, uh, that, that address, that uh, key pair. But what happens if my account gets uh, compromised or, or, you know, somehow I, I lose, you know, my key. Like, what, what you know, I'll just lose my, not only will I lose the Bitcoin that's in that, that address, I will, like, lose my entire identity and have to start from scratch. It'd be like losing your entire Twitter account or Facebook or whatever. So, like, how do we solve this? Uh, so the, the solution we've come up with is delegated keys. And basically the way this would work is in, like, an offline cold storage type wallet, you could generate an address and then uh, generate a transaction that links that to the child key. So then on memo.cache, you would have uh, you know, your, your key on memo, and then uh, if, 
and then you would link it via two, two transactions that link the two accounts, to the, the master key and the child key together. Then if your memo account ever got compromised or you, or you lost it or whatever, you could take your master key and, and issue a transaction that says, you know, invalidate this child key that's not related to me anymore um, and issue maybe a new child key for, that I'm gonna use on memo going forward. And this would be all be transparent, you know, this could be abstracted away. The user would never really know uh, this, or you know, you could abstract a lot of this away. This is how the, it would work in the background. Um, and then it doesn't need to be just two layers of keys. You know, maybe you don't want to have to go to cold storage every time you sign up for a new account on a new application. Uh, so you could have, you know, multiple tiers of keys. So you could have, you know, similar to like a certificate authority, you could have a, a root certificate, intermediate certificates, and then, you know, any number of layers of child certificates. Um, and then similar here, you'd, you could have like a root key and then you could have like intermediate keys. Like maybe you have a key on your phone and then when you sign into websites, uh, you could use that key to, to generate the, or to link it to the child keys. So you could have this whole hierarchy of an identity. And basically all these keys would all link back to your master key, which would be your entire um, basically online identity. Uh, so you'd be linked across all sites. So if you had an account like if on Twitter, an account on Facebook, and an account on Reddit, if they're all linked to the same master key, you'd, you'd share your contacts and everything between all these, all these services. Uh, so that, you know, you don't have to sign up for, for Instagram and then all of a sudden, you know, you have zero followers and, and you're not connected to anyone and you have to rebuild your whole network and all over again. All right. Uh, handles. Um, so another thing that was requested early on is uh, a way to, like, tag people in a post. The, the issue is Memo is, like, decentralized. We have no way of enforcing unique names. Uh, so... Actually, right when Memo launched, uh, there was obviously the account called Memo, and then someone else just created another account called Memo. And then they started posting fake announcements, and they were like, you know, you know, we're gonna add support for this or that, and people were getting very confused. They're like, why does Memo keep saying that they're gonna do this or... Um, so one of the very first, th that, that was one of the very first problems we had to deal with. If you can see in this uh, post, see how it has their name and it says 10% next to them? Uh, so that becomes like a, basically a ranking. It's a personalized ranking based on who's viewing the user. So basically this says that like 10% of the people that I'm following are following this person as well. So if someone creates a fake account called Memo and starts posting stuff, they're gonna have a 0% next to them because no one's gonna be following them. Um, and, so, and then actually, if you're actually following someone directly, it'll just say that you're following them directly. You don't even get a percentage. So this sort of solved that problem. Uh, now, now they're, you know, people can have the same name, but, but it's, you know, you can still know who, who they are. Um, and, and that's basically the way, you know, we plan to go forward is, you, since we can't enforce unique names, we'll have to do something like this. Which actually, if you think about it, this is how the real world works, you know. There's plenty of people that have the same name. Uh, in, in, like, the U.S., like, John Smith is, like, probably the most popular name. Um, you know, people don't put John Smith, like, one, two, three, like they don't put like a bunch of numbers after their name so, so that they can be unique. Uh, you know, they use like their social security number or, you know, whatever identity number that they have to, to actually identify them. Uh, their name doesn't have to be unique. And, and that's sort of the way that we sort of to see it happening on Memo. And uh, just to give a little more background about like my philosophy on uh, kind of handles in general, uh, like DNS is probably the most uh, well-known handle or like naming system out there. And it, uh, it's a huge system, you know, registrars take tons of money and, and uh, people like pay tons of money for domains and then sure enough, like, I try to create memo, I look it up, like memo.com is, is taken by some squatter that's trying to charge a ton of money for me to use it. Uh, it's, and I think, you know, people have spent tens of millions of dollars on domain names. So I, I think that you know, a lot of the infrastructure that has to go around maintaining that type of system is, is really expensive and, and, you know, there's, there's other ways you can do it. So, yeah, handles is something we plan to add support for. Um, uh, actually, b before I go, so, like, another thing, like, if, if, let's say I'm not connected to someone and, and I want to buy, like, shoes from Nike, so I, like, type at Nike and uh, it can use, like, heuristics and be like, all right, we're pretty sure you mean, like, the real Nike and it'll, and it'll send you to their, to their page. Uh, and based on like your connections and, and who's following and, and, and stuff like that. All right, so uh, next is pages. Uh, so you, 
uh, many people probably heard of Bitcoin files. It's a, it's a great uh, example of this. Um, also, the crypto graffiti guy yesterday was talking about having HTML like on the blockchain. Uh, it's totally great. Um, so let's say like you know Nike has has their their online identity and you could almost you could put your entire website uh, potentially on the blockchain. Um, I actually don't think HTML necessarily will be the best. Uh, I think we'll need like a like a Bitcoin markup language or something. Um, but we'll see how that evolves. Uh, but anyways, if you're you know you're Nike and you have your website and you want to you know edit it, you don't want to like have to post the entire website over again. You want to post like a diff. Um, so. Basically, we've been building out the protocol actions that would be necessary to kind of do like Git on chain, essentially, uh, where you know you, you can post a file and then you can post diffs, and and there'd be like this whole history. And uh, so, like if you know, let's say you have like a like a news agency and they were post some some fake news and then they edit it later. Well, that whole history would be there. You could be like uh, you could point to it and say exactly when they changed it. Um, on, on top of all, who knows what other possibilities could could come of this. Uh, all right, everything right now on, on Memo is all clear text, regular communication, uh, but people are already requesting, like, how do I message someone, like, uh, securely? So encrypted communication is a natural next step for us. Uh, it's actually not, I mean, there's a lot of ex existing stuff we can use. Uh, you know, if you're connecting, if you're, you have your address and you know who you're talking to, you can use some, like, ECDH and encrypt your message uh, in, in the transaction, and then they're the only ones that, that can decrypt it. So uh, one uh, cr you know, criticism that you might see is like, why would I put encrypted data on the blockchain? Like, that seems ridiculous. Like, people are going to have supercomputers or quantum computers in the future, and they're going to, like, decrypt all of, all of these old messages. Uh, so that, that's definitely a risk. Uh, one interesting uh, counterpoint that I heard was that actually all, you know, all of your encrypted communication on the, that exists right now, it may not be written to the blockchain, but it is being transmitted through public networks. And anyone who controls those networks could could read and store that data indefinitely and, and decrypt it in the future. And actually, when Snowden uh, was captured or whatever, or not captured, but you know became known, uh, whatever email service he was using, the NSA tried to to get their SSL keys. And it's it's not because they were trying to use their keys to uh, decrypt future information. It's because they had been actually capturing all of the communication between Snowden and that website. And they, they were going to use the SSL keys to decrypt it after the fact. Um, so anyways, it, definitely some concerns about storing encrypted data on the blockchain forever. But, um, you know, the trade-offs. So if we have encrypted communication on the chain, um, that enables a bunch of other use cases. So, so let's say, you know, at Nike, uh, you know, post their store online using, you know, the pages. And, and now someone can actually purchase something from the Nike store. Uh, so by basically encrypting, you know, their address or whatever it is where it needs to be shipped and, and sending it to Nike. Uh, I mean, I think actually it would probably be, you can do it even more securely like that than that, where you, kind of like Tor, where you choose your own routing. You know, you could say, okay, you just ship it to this person, and then you encrypt another message to that person. Okay, you ship it to that person, and uh, whatever. So the person who's, who initially sends it has no idea where it's even going. Um, all kinds of possibilities you could do. Uh, digital marketplaces, uh, Decentralized marketplaces are definitely going to be coming, uh, no question. I, I'm not even saying we're going to do it. This is just stuff that's going to happen. Um, and so uh, to wrap it up, uh, uh, the one thing that, that probably isn't going to work on chain is large media. Uh, you know, I'm not going to upload a 10 gig video to the blockchain. And uh, I don't think that's ever going to get fixed because as time goes on, video is going to only keep getting higher quality. So, like, you know, I'm not going to upload some 360 VR video 10 years from now either. That's like 10 terabytes to the blockchain either. So, there's, you're always going to need some sort of off-chain data storage solution. Um, IPFS in the short term has some potential, um, but long term, I think you could have something, a protocol that actually is on-chain, where you say, like, here's a hash of my data, and uh, like, here's some IP addresses where you can find it at, and you could even have like. Uh, you know, a decentralized system for saying, you know, I want this level of redundancy for this data, and I'm willing, you know, and I'll find the cheapest person that'll store this data for me, and uh, and it can, you know, this could all be transparent to like a, an end user, but you can securely store your data on chain. Um, so yeah, using this technology, I think we could 
basically get rid of uh, the whole concept of the cloud as it exists today. All apps that currently exist right now that operate on the cloud could be using the blockchain as their backend.